I'm Joyce Hornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. You are listening to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Hornady Podcast, the show where we talk all things hunting, shooting, and ballistics. I've got a nice panel for you guys here today. To my left, project engineer Miles Neville, and then across the table, we've got marketeer Matt Ritchie and fellow engineer with Miles, Brendan Meyer. Guys, thanks for coming on the show. Happy Morning. To be here. Pleasure as always. Now, it is a, a pretty topical episode, depending on when we get this one out, but as far as the recording of this episode goes, we're just breaking into 2024, and what that means for a lot of us is the match season is upon us. You know, Matt, you handle all of our match sponsorships and our sponsored shooters, so you're seeing those matches around the country really starting to kick off, and it's a pretty exciting time of year. You know, people trying new cartridges, new barrels, new guns, new bullets, new gear, uh, people just trying them out for the first few matches, and in, it's, it's really just an exciting time because you know, blow the cobwebs out, you know, you had all winter long where, you know, you got fat and happy over the holidays, but it's time to get after it now. Yeah, it's, uh, my uh, calendar in my cubicle is awful full of dates of matches on the weekends and things like that. But yeah, it is, it's getting started. March is, March is a pretty heavy month as far as, you know, PRS and NRL Hunter matches are concerned, but I know there's some of those guys have already been shooting. They've already got two to three matches under their belt. So depending on regionally where you're at, you've been maybe shooting already. So that's great. It's great to see. I know you guys have already shot already and I, and we'll talk about that. Um, what I want this podcast to be is for maybe that entry level guy who's competent marksman, really practicing, you know, a student of the gun, if you will, and they're ready to step into that competitive circle. And, you know, there's some, some hurdles to get over there. And one of those hurdles and one of the funner parts of it is picking what cartridge you're going to compete with. And we're going to discuss maybe what are your processes to go through caliber cartridge selection, how you set your rifles up, maybe what games you're playing. You know, the PRS game is fun, but so is NRL Hunter. And so are some of those outlaw matches and the sniper team matches. And, you know, there's a lot of other games to play in the precision rifle world than just PRS, but PRS is a pretty fun one. Now, before we get into some of this criteria, I want to give the listener a little background uh, to relative new guest to the show, Brendan Meyer. Because Brendan, you know, you've been with Hornady now for several years, but you came in uh, not a precision rifle competitor. And in pretty short order, you went from, yeah, you've got some guns to now you have several custom built precision rifle systems. So give us a quick background on what got you into shooting and hunting. And as you came to Hornady, what what got you into wanting to try these precision rifle games? Well, so, yeah, grew up hunting, you know, a lot um, out west. And typically you're shooting a little bit further out there. You're not shooting 100 yards or under. So I kind of always liked a little bit longer range stuff. Um, and then as I got into Hornady, I'd, even before that, I started looking into PRS a little bit. It just seemed like a lot of fun super super in your mind you know you yeah, gotta it's a head game. it's a head game you gotta do this and you gotta be really really strategic with how you go through the stages so i kind of liked that part of it as well um really liked long range shooting in general um and so then when i got here getting talking to miles and you and everybody around the office it just seemed seemed easy nowadays everything's prefits you got custom actions that are just phenomenal um, and stocks and chassis galore nowadays. So it, it kind of made it easy. Got my first rifle, which was just a factory Remington 700 um, with a regular HS stock on it. And nice then, stock. but yeah, yeah, nice stock. And then just from there, it's gotten <laughs> a little crazy, but yeah. So you went head first into it. Yeah. Awesome. And We'll jump ahead here a little bit, but you went from, got your first kind of precision rifle, uh, you know, with the HS stock and, you know, rebarreled the Remington 700 to now you just went to a national level two day PRS match and placed 32nd, 32nd, which for the listener who has not competed in a PRS match, you, you 
break top 50%, you know, and you've got 180 competitors and you're number 32, that's, that's a pretty darn fine showing for somebody that doesn't do this for a living. You know, when, you know, you, you show up and yeah, we, you know, run three, four, five matches a year if we can, but you've got a lot of other things. And so to break into that, you know, top 25% or top 30% is, is pretty respectable, man. Like, really respectable. I had a lot of a lot of good coaches. Miles and Joe Thielen that's been on the podcast a lot really helped yeah. me a lot and we do a lot of a lot of practice and it's yeah, it's been great. Yeah, so we were far. and we were squatted with yeah, a, he was a bunch too. of heavy hitters too. Oh, so yeah. those guys were, you know, and that's one of the, one of the things in that in that squad we were all communicating, "Hey, what do you run for wind? What do you think on this? What angle? What are you getting for wind speed?" So all that just communication and yeah. definitely not just me. <laughs> no, but you do have to have a, 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 a tighten up behind the bolt. Now we talked about, you know, Miles and, and Joe Thielen specifically, those guys show up to a match and they're, they're, you know, they're looking to place at that match. But, uh, for the large amount of us, I would say the hefty majority of PRS shooters, we're in the middle of the pack and we're just trying to get to the top of the middle of the pack. And it's crazy how hard you have to fight and claw to break that line. You know, when you look at we were just talking about this the other day. When I look back at my performance in, like, say, 2014 and how I perform at a match now, I'd be winning matches in 2014, but the level of competition has gotten so good. The average competitor now has just an amazing, you know, equipment and they're really good at managing their time and their ballistics and their reloading and their bullets. All right. It's just remarkable. Yeah. There's a ton of, ton of training that's happened, a ton of information that's been disseminated and it's, yeah. there's a, yeah, a more or less a standardized approach to it now. Or I remember when I first started getting into PR, you know, precision rifle shooting, it was, you had to like seek out information and some of it was good and some of it <laughs> well, <laughs> not so much. We but. talk about, you know, the precision rifle series, the NRL hunter, and even like sports like uh, the mammoth sniper challenge, for example, or the guardian long range match or some of these team matches. They're games. And so once, you know, if you've never played a, a game, well, yeah, it could be hard to figure it out. But once everybody knows how to play the game, then there's some standardization that happens. And these are games. And so once you figure out the game, you know, the people that figure out the game first generally, you know, go to the top and, and, and that I, kind of sorts I think you can see that out. too from, I know that you remember the rifle that I started shooting when I started working here and that changed pretty quick. I went to national two-day matches and looked around and it's like okay i've got the wrong tool for this yep and i was in the exact same boat and we'll talk about those setups here you know coming up because i think a lot of us listeners and internal started that way so let's get into it here so well when you're as an entry-level guy like you know brendan when you were an entry-level guy just you know five years ago or whenever that was for you uh what were some of your criteria that you looked at for how do I pick a cartridge? Because that's there's a lot that goes into that, and there's a give and take relationship with every aspect of it. So uh, I'll kick it over to Brendan first. When you got to Hornady, okay, this is what we're doing. This is a sport. A lot of people are playing it. How did you pick a cartridge? Well, I think I I kind of went about it. I'm a I'm a decently small statured guy, so I kind of went about it about a you know a gun weight versus recoil. You know, that's kind of where I'm first looking. Um, I don't want something that's going to kick me so hard that I kind of come off target and can't see. So I kind of started leaning towards some of those lighter recoiling cartridges um, in the six mil range. Um, kind of started there. Um, and everything nowadays with your scopes and turrets, everything is easy. I mean, it's going to, your Hornady Ford Off is going to tell you what you're going to do. So it's not like, it's not like you're picking something specifically for how much drop it has. I don't think. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. So you went six millimeter right out of the gate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just just that's kind of what most people have been shooting in PRS from what I had seen. So I kind of just went that route to begin with. Sure. Which is a good route. That is, you know, definitely one of the criteria. Miles, for you, when you came to Hornady, you were already actively engaged in precision rifle shooting but not so much on the competition side. So where did you start and, and how did that flow through your selection process? Well, so I had been shooting competitions, but not like the national two-day stuff. So I'd been doing, I guess you call them outlaw matches, just local stuff around Rapid City where I was going to school over in Wyoming, South Dakota, stuff like that. 
Um, and, and those are still, I, I still enjoy going to those when I can. Yeah. Um, doesn't burn up your whole weekend. That's a nice thing. You get a, get a day with it. But, uh, at, at that time I had kind of gone into the six, five millimeter, uh, a lot of wind out there in Wyoming and South Dakota. And the six, five seemed to, seemed to do really well with that. And then, um, I've, I've back and forth between, you know, six and six, five for splash on target at, most of the time you're fine, but then once you get past, you know, 800 yards, it seems like the 22s and six millimeters get a little bit light for w- even hitting the target sometimes with the 22s. Um, so I had, I was actually shooting a 260 that was like a Creedmoorized match reamer. Yeah. It was a custom build. Um, and I got into that kind of before the 6.5 Creedmoor, kind of as the 6.5 Creedmoor was really taking off. Um, and I just, I was like six, five Creedmoor 260. I, I don't know. I, I picked, yeah, I picked one, um, and had, a, I was doing a custom build in any, anyway and reloading everything anyway. Um, but I do remember, uh, picking up a piece of brass at one of the ranges I went to and was like, wow, that looks, that looks done right. You know, on the six, five Creedmoor was like, well, I've already got the reloading stuff. I'm settled into it. And then once I got here, uh, it was a lot easier to make that transition yeah, or to, yeah. <laughs> or to six, five Creedmoor. Um, and it just made sense. And, and prior to that, I would still, I was living in the old dogma of like, well, if you want a precision rifle, you have to hand load. That's the only way to do it. Um, and, and after having been here, being an intern, and I think we spun up a six, five barrel while I was an intern here and shot factory ammo and saw the performance that I was getting out of the factory. And I was like, well, that's, that's an easy button because that way, at least if I feel lazy or something happens and my reloads don't work or I can't make them in time, I, I got factory boxed ammo that I, I can resort to. So you came out of the gate with 6.5 millimeter going with the 260 and then the 6.5 because that was already picking up. Matt, I have to get into your past a little bit because you were uh, a bench rest shooter and shooting a little hot rod 6.5. So when you transitioned over to the precision rifle games, did you stay with the 6.5? Mm, no. So... I started out hot rod 6.5, 6.5, 284, then went transition 6.5 Creedmoor because, again, that's kind of, I think they give you that when you get hired on here. They yeah. give you a box of 6.5 Creedmoor ammo, like, this is what you're going to do now. But uh, then I went, then, you know, as I kind of started in there and got further down the, the trail with the, the Ventress stuff, a lot of those guys, their light guns are predominantly 6 millimeter. So went to a 6 Creedmoor, and then transition to a little br variant six bra creed or a six millimeter shot that and then kind of like miles like i had that stuff so then my first barrel on my mat my prs match gun went with a six br because i had the brass had the dice had all of the all the stuff all the stuff but uh then just kind of stayed on the six mil stuff um i do run a i still run a hot rod six five for my nrl hunter gun just because of you know, power factor power factor and you know um unknown distances or at least the targets until you get a good range on them but your range estimation you know might not be exact you're not you're not ranging that exact target the distance so you got a little bit of forgiveness there with a flat shooting six five and it bucks the wind really well but uh my my choice is really just recoil like being able to see where i hit on that plate and then being able to make a correction like this weekend this last weekend watching you know some of those top level guys like seeing them when you're spotting and you see them hit and that, that plate twists one way, you're like, Oh, okay. They were whatever edge of that plate. And then they, they automatically make that correction. And then they run the rest of the stage out and they're center punching plates. It's like, ah, they got to figure it that's, out. That's, that's, you know, what it, what you need, yep. you need that something to where you can spot your impact, but not lose, you know, and watch your trace and see where it's at and then make it so you can make your corrections. Out here. You may only get one chance. So never compromise. At any distance. Match accurate ELDX bullets, highest BCs, flat trajectories, and unparalleled terminal performance at all practical ranges. Precision Hunter Ammunition from Hornady. That Clay's cartridge uh, match there, that was obviously the wind was blowing, especially on day two from what I hear. Uh, so before we get into some specific criteria, I will say the way it worked for me was uh, I started here and built my first kind of air quote precision rifle in 2013 in 308 Winchester. And I'd never even heard of the PRS. 
at that time, which was just, you know, I think that started in 2012. So got that gun built in 308 and, and the mentality where there was, that's what everybody was doing. That's what all the, you know, obviously the military snipers were doing. And that just was the, that's just what you did. You built a 308 precision rifle. And just like Miles mentioned, I was shooting exclusively hand loads and ran my first uh, match uh, with that and, and did actually really well, but it wasn't a PRS match. It was one of those sniper game type matches, the competition dynamic sniper adventure challenge. Uh, our senior ballistician and I, Jaden Quinlan, we ran that as a team, uh, actually won the division, which was cool. And then a couple of weeks later, we ran a match that was actually turned out to be what PRS is now. And holy cow, boy, did, did I have my eyes opened. That was incredible. I was blown away uh, it, and, and hooked, really. So it became evident, okay, the 308 is not the cartridge to be competing in the open division. Uh, the range, you know, the range, the amount of drop, the amount of wind, the amount of recoil, there's a lot of things. So I went 6.5 Creedmoor as well. And then just like a lot of you guys, I went from Creedmoor to 6 Creedmoor to 6 Arc to GT to all over the place. And I would say between all of us and the people within the building, we've tried it all, really. Uh, we've got, you know, people that have ran Dashers, Arcs, 22 cal stuff, 308s, I mean, all over. And uh, that's what we're really going to get into the nitty gritty of, if you will. So the one thing I'd like to talk about is first isolating your caliber, not necessarily your cartridge selection, but your bullet diameter. So when you guys are trying to pick a bullet diameter, one of the things that, or some of the things that jump out to me that you have to be considerate of is the amount of recoil, the barrel life, you know, what's your expected barrel life, what's your wind look like out at range, and bullet drop, like you mentioned, Brandon, already forward off, you set it upright, bullet drop is almost not important uh, for a lot of the games we play. Uh, the location in which you primarily shoot. So I, we try to do stuff, you know, out in the Western Continental 48 here, and you got big uh, wind gradients, right? So you've got, you know, wind changes speed the higher you go up in elevation. So if you're shooting off of a cliff face, uh, you know, now you have this big potential for wind gradient. And so that's a, a concern for me. Brass, you know, does Hornady make brass is a concern of mine, but you know, for the listener, it, you know, it, what's brass availability like? What powders go into it. What powders does this cartridge thrive on? Because man, there was a while there where people were paying $600 for eight pounds of Varget. Uh, and I can't play that game. Very no, long. I, think, yeah. I think I saw double. Yeah. 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 And so for a while. budget, you know, what's, it, am I just getting into this? Am I going to try to burn out some barrels and, and really, you know, get into this? Uh, and then do I want to run it with a muzzle breaker or suppressor that comes into it as well, kind of tied back to recoil. So I know I just mentioned a whole bunch of things, but let's narrow it down first to caliber with some of these things that I mentioned in mind. So how do you guys pick from 22 to 6 to 6.5 to maybe 7 millimeter, maybe to 30 caliber? Um, what are your influences of all the things that I mentioned and anything I didn't that help you pick your caliber? Uh, recoil, splash, wind deflection. That's, that's the most of it. That's the most of it? Yeah. Yep. Um, and Miles you're the only one here that has a PRS bullet uh, and the only one here that actively competed in the gas gun division. So uh, you've got some different answers because you compete in the open and the gas gun, but primarily you've landed in the six millimeter world. Yeah. Yeah. So after my six, five, uh, I saw the gamer guns and I said, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do that. If we're going to have a game, if let's we're play gonna, a game. If we're all shooting 25 pound rifles, then I guess I'll shoot a 25 pound rifle. Um, and I built, First, a six Creedmoor, and wasn't really impressed with the recoil reduction from a six five Creedmoor to a six Creedmoor. And then I noticed that the bullets were getting there so fast that I couldn't really couldn't really see it on a lot of the closer shots. Like um, my recoil management at the time, maybe it'd be better now, but at the time it was like it, it's just it's getting there too quick. Um, I'm I'm still not seeing it. My recoil isn't that much better that I can you know get back on target and see this stuff. 
And then the barrel life on it was, you know, 1,500, 1,800, maybe 2,000 rounds. And that is way more than, yeah. I, I pulled coming, a barrel at 980. From a, <laughs> right. Coming from a 6.5 Creedmoor where I, my last barrel I pulled at 3,500 rounds. It was like, well, this is kind of not consistent. And it wasn't, it wasn't really consistent throughout the range of the barrel life either. Like you'd start getting a drop off after 1,200 rounds, right? So even if you stretched it, you start to see things happen. Um, so I wasn't too impressed with that. So kind of as a joke, I think we talked about this on the podcast before, but as a joke, um, somebody's like, well, why don't you run a six arc? And I was like, okay. Yeah. So I spun up a barrel and started running it and, uh, yeah, I fell in love. And yeah. so in your 25 pound, yeah, in a heavy race, 20, 20 to 22 pound, um, yeah. Weighted down PRS gamer gun. Uh, yeah, I'm running six arc and, uh, I liked it so much. I've got, I think six or seven barrels now pre-spun up, ready to go, broken in, know, know what the load that I shoot does in them. Um, and they're just set aside. So that's probably what I'm going to be shooting for the next. That's a lifetime of barrels with a six arc too. Yeah. Like, yeah. Cause you're getting four or 5,000 <laughs> so, rounds of barrel. Out right. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I pulled one at 4,500 rounds cause I got scared. Cause like a, a, it shouldn't, it shouldn't shoot this good this long, but I think it probably still, still had. Yeah. <laughs> I swear to God. Yeah. I think it, it, it ended up over it in your place. So, yeah. but basically for me, uh, the, if you, if you run a, run the math on felt recoil, um, versus like bl- bl- ex- exterior ballistics, uh, if you run kind of the best class, best weight class in caliber bullets, right? So the highest BC bullets that you're going to get at the velocities that they'll go. And then you weigh that out versus the recoil. The smaller you go, the better that trend looks. And, and it, even 22 looks better than six millimeter. The, the problem then arises when a little bit with wind, um, but nothing drastic there. The real problem it, when you get to the field is when you hit those 800 to 1200 yard targets in the PRS game, or even in our, well, in our hunter, you can't cause it's, caliber restricted or or uh, power factor restricted but in prs yeah you you start getting to those 800 yard targets and if it's a hot miragey day on flat ground even seeing hits with the 22 cal at 800 a 1, thousand 1200 yards on a, on a plate is like questionable you know if there's not a hit indicator or something that's reliably working it it's like i don't i don't know what happened there bud sorry you so know? that's part of your caliber selection is does it have enough mass that when it gets there I know where it went. Right. And, and I also, think that's oh, also yeah. if you miss, you know, seeing that splash in the, you know, getting that feedback from the, the, the dirt around it, you know, a 22 cal at those farther distances, you're like, I, I don't There's know. Not, not enough steam left in it yeah. to, to really kick dirt out of the way. So that's where you'll start seeing people drift 25, you know, it, most people six millimeters about as light as they go. There are guys that shoot 22 and they do it successfully. In fact, Jeff, the guy that, that got first place in Gaskin, he's running a 22 GT in his gas gun and, and he ended up winning the series last year. So there, there's definitely, um, application for it. It just all comes with trade-offs. And so you'll see, yeah, the a bulk of people are probably running between six and six, five. Um, and that's that little trade-off between more recoil, uh, lower velocity and, and then, but then you get less wind deflection with the higher BC six, five bullets and then more splash downrange. Yeah. Well, let's kick this now over to Brendan because we talked about caliber and we kind of jumped into cartridge where you went with six millimeter arc and there's factory options. We have, obviously we have brass. So that's an easy button for you. Well, Brendan, let's talk about how you went from six millimeter to six millimeter to six millimeter and now where you're ended up now and what guided you to that caliber and cartridge selection. Cause this is kind of a, you know, if you look at the precision rifle sports as a whole, this is coming back full circle now. Cause you started with a six Creed. Correct. Yeah. I started with a six Creed, um, and kind of found the same problems that miles did where that bullet is getting there so fast that especially at stuff under 500 yards, it it's hitting before you're like back in, you know, back on target and watching for, um, splash. So I kind of played that game for a couple matches that first year. Then I went, okay, I want something a little less recoil. Like you said, the six, it, about the same as a six, five Creedmoor. So I went down and played the ARC game. So I ran ARC for a while. Loved it, as a matter of fact. Uh, kind of jumped back up to the GT just to get a little bit more velocity out of it. Run the 110 A tips a little bit better. And then now running 6.5 Creedmoor this year. Um, and been really, really happy with yeah. it. And um, what drove that selection? I think wind deflection. Uh, I'm still young enough and early enough in the game that I'm not the best at calling wind. I know 
nobody's perfect. Join but, the club. Yeah. Okay. But so there's, you get, it's more forgiving, right? If I'm off by five, 10 degrees on my wind, or I'm off a mile or two per hour on my wind, it's not going to affect me quite as much as running like a six arc or something. Um, so that's kind of what drove me to that. Plus, like you said, I shoot a lot out west. You know, you're in Oklahoma, South Dakota, Nebraska, Wyoming, Utah, places where there's big, wide, vast expanses that are running 10, 15, we saw 20, 25 mile an hour winds down at Clays, um, down in Oklahoma. So that's kind of what pushed me towards the 6.5, um, running them a little slow on purpose, um, just being able to manage that recoil and just watch them come in is kind of been really nice matt now you you went to six five and down to six and you're still running six yeah so my current gun is a i've got i've got a six arc that i just built um and it it's it's great i love it i kind of i kind of went with a you know a two-pronged attack on it i've got my original prs gun i built i'm gonna get it in the six five creedmoor and that's gonna be when we do go south or west i'm gonna and there's gonna be wind i'm gonna shoot a six five creed more um obviously i don't have it ready so i had to take my six arc down to oklahoma which it was great for barricade stuff and positional things and even land prone you could i could watch all of that stuff i just suck at calling wind well yeah and when you but on day two when you get a wind change in speed of 10 or more mile an hour plus it changes 15 to 20 degrees from in the vector like i i mean I was struggling up a six. It will. I was struggling. I mean, obviously there's guys that are really, really good at it, but they shoot thousands of more rounds a year than I do. So I'm, I'm running my six arc. And when I go to, you know, when we go to gap grind K&M and shoot that match, obviously that's, I'm going to bring the six arc, you know, and have fun. But I also have kids that are getting old enough. I want to start taking them. And so if we can hit some one day regional matches and take my kids, I don't want them having to fight with something. So that six arc's not super heavy. It's like, 18 pounds okay which is may seem like a lot but it's not really that much compared to 22 or 24 or 25 pounds yeah so does powder selection come into play when you're choosing your caliber and subsequent cartridge um do you guys have like okay i know i want to use Varget or i want to use 4350 or i want to use whatever do you guys have that go to okay i'm going to choose a cartridge just based on the propellant yeah i mean you want Varget or 4350 reloader 16 or reloader 26 yeah, well, literally twenty six for the PRS games is probably a little little slow. You can you can make yeah. it work in a Creed more. You can yes, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you want you want one of those good powders to fit. That's that's the ideal case is that one of those known good performing powders that has really good temperature stability. Um, if that fits in your and if you have multiples that you can pick from, like the six arc is unfortunately kind of a one trick pony there. Where I've got Varget in a bolt gun. And if to be you know really relevant for PRS, I have to run a 26 or 28 inch barrel. I got to run a longer barrel, and Varget has to work. Yeah, or the new Stable Match. Oh, right. Yeah, Stable Match. Yeah, if you can. Yep. So yeah, I've got a couple of options, and I mean, there's others. I could try IMR 48 or H 4895 or some XBR 8208. There's some others, but the, you lose a little bit on temp stability, maybe, but and a little velocity. Right, and velocity as well. So like you can corner yourself that way. Uh, luckily, Varget has worked every time for me um but yeah bumping up into like the by 47s or the gts or the creedmoors really gets you in a realm where depending on the bullet weight within that family you got varget 4250 reloader 16 like you got quite a you got more options basically so if you're stuck with a bullet that you know you want to run you got more powder options to play with that that can get you a win and win yeah, and load that's part of i in my opinion i think if you're choosing a prs cartridge that should be one of the things that is in your consideration little handbook is what propellants because there are propellants that have a track record for producing just nuts on accuracy every time var gets one of them 4350 is one of them and in those cartridges where we're you know we're playing with they're relatively small and you know a medium medium slow medium fast powder between var and 4350 they generally work the best um, i will say for me caliber selection when i Went from 308 Winchester, and I built my first 6.5. I still wasn't committed to the game of PRS. I thought it was actually kind of silly to invest that much money into something that I couldn't do anything else with but play this one game. And I was still doing more field-style matches and stuff. So what I built was a 
14 pound or 13 and a half pound 6.5 Creedmoor medium palma barrel chassis very very utilitarian i could uh yeah i could take that pretty well anywhere and and do a match with it and go on a coyote hunt with it and it was just again a good field uh rifle but the 65 it was a little bit too much recoil for the weight of the gun and so i ended up okay if we're going to play the game kind of like you well let's play the game then so i built a gamer gun and i used actually your takeoff arc barrel and put it together and i knew i wanted to go six millimeter because uh that's the lower the recoil i want to see splash on the target uh it's a competitive advantage for the wind and the bullet drop compared to the six five so i actually had a hs factory built rifle in six millimeter creedmoor and that thing was the most accurate rifle i've ever owned and probably still to this day the hit target impact indicator instant hit confirmation at extended ranges has never been easier the hit target impact indicator easily attaches to most target stands and not the steel target itself the highly sensitive internal accelerometer detects vibration when the target is impacted activating the red led lights that flash morse code for hit where impact confirmation can be difficult Light it up with the HIT Target Impact Indicator from Hornady. The Catch-22 is just like you guys had mentioned. It got to the target so fast that I actually was shooting the same scores as I was with my 14-pound Creedmoor, my 6.5 Creedmoor. So next thing you know, I've got 980 rounds on the barrel, and it's, wow, almost time to start thinking about a new barrel, and I shot three matches with it. So. Uh, I knew I wanted to, to look into something with better barrel life. So what I did towards the end of my Creedmoor barrel life is I went to Varget. Now, most people wouldn't associate a 6mm Creedmoor with running Varget, but I did. I backed it down. Uh, we have a piezoelectric pressure eating system, and at the time, I worked with it every day. So end of a shift, yeah, let me, let me see what this Varget will do. And I found a charge of Varget that ran at 58,000 pounds that shot darts. I mean, this thing was bullet on top of bullet on top of bullet, 110 A-tips at 2835 feet per second. I was chugging them out there. Uh, and I shot a match with that. And I was like, okay, this is the way. The six millimeter going slow, I'm watching everything happen. So then I get my arc put together and I ran my first match with the six millimeter arc. It was the Hornady PRC in Utah. Which, if, if you've ever been there, you guys around the table have, that's not a good match to run a six arc. Whoa. Needless to say. Uh, that's disrespectful. Unless you're, I was saying unless you're miles in the yeah, middle. It gets, <laughs> well, I'm just saying it gets blown around a little yeah. bit oh, because yeah. you're shooting off cliff faces. You're shooting soup. They have a mile target. Yeah. It, it, if, cross if, canyons, there was a, canyons, if there was a, yeah. Yeah, a PRS match that a PRC would be applicable for, that's probably it's that one. one. Yeah. So uh, I, I show up to this match six millimeter arc and i shot the match of my life there was only a couple stages where i did not see every single bullet that left the barrel so i was like okay this is this is the right answer i think um it was just again i could watch every bullet i could make the even when i hit the target i could make the corrections within the plate to put the bullet in the center and to me that made a huge deal and i think for me the selection process did come down to what powder and recoil i knew i could use varget i knew i could get the low recoil i'd already proven that to myself with my six creedmoor that was uh you know on the on its way out and i had factory ammo options should i want to go that route um i knew i wanted to run a muzzle break to bring the recoil down even further so i didn't mind running a 28 inch barrel um so to me that that was awesome but just like you mentioned matt now that I've, I've I've shot more matches out west, I've never really shot any matches east, but I'm gonna go back to the 6.5 millimeter one because of the barrel life. If I can get similar barrel life to a six millimeter arc, but pick up some wind performance, I think I'm gonna go that route. I'm gonna go back to 6.5 Creedmoor. I'm gonna toss those 153s out at like 2625 or 2650 or something. I'll still have plenty of factory loaded ammo should I want to go that route. Um, I can use the same cartridge for NRL Hunter and PRS. And 
it fits my budget and my, I'm going to call it time budget. How much time am I willing to invest in this sport? There was a time where I was investing a lot of time and a lot of money over the last seven years. That's not me anymore. And so for my minimal investment in time, I get a maximum investment in my equipment. The barrel's going to last forever. I can, I know once I break it in and work the load up for it, that it's, that's what it's going to be on. It's on cruise control for the next 3,500 rounds. And to me, that, that means something. And so for the new shooter that's looking in and seeing, oh, I'll, everybody's running dashers and I have to fire form brass and this, that, and the other thing, you could just jump into a 6.5 Creedmoor, not give up anything on the performance envelope, and you're seeing a lot of shooters actually come back to the 6.5 Creedmoor or the 25 Creedmoor. Well, and the, and the thing with, you know, everybody went low recoil, low recoiling six millimeter rounds, and now, you know, with the advancement in all of the trinkets and gadgets that, you know, the high performance muzzle brakes that are super efficient, the stocks, the chassis, the weight systems you can add to these things, you can run a 6.5 Creedmoor, run 140s or 147 ELDMs, and not give anything up on, you know, positional props and things like that with, with, in regards to recoil. Yeah. So recoil and spot in your own shot. And let's yeah. not forget the 135A tip. I talked about 153, Brendan. I think that's what you're shooting. Yep. 153s. Yeah. If you want to pick up that speed, jump into that 135 and that's a slippery widget right there. I will say I have a uh, six, five Creedmoor barrel on, you know, in the, in the stall there in case I decide I need it. But, uh, before it was a six, five Creedmoor, I even played around with a uh, six, five Grindle. Yeah. Long throated. And uh, it's it was too slow um, to really be effective. But what was interesting, uh, the little local range where we can all hang out um, at four and five hundred yards, uh, there's something to be said for something that's going twenty four or fifty foot per second as far as watching your own trace because you see it on every shot. Yeah. And <laughs> uh, it, it was tempting, but yeah, it went, the the long ball stuff it just falls apart, unfortunately. But yeah, the, I wouldn't be afraid to run a one fifty three at twenty five fifty twenty six hundred, um, because if you can get the recoil management side of it down and you can spot your stuff, you will see your your own trace. And that's one of the main benefits for me with the six arc and such a heavy rifle is that the recoil is is non-existent and and in a good prone position or a a solid bagged up position even on targets that are silhouetted you know over the top of a hill yep uh i can watch my own trace and you can i mean there have been points made up that way where i missed the first shot saw the trace go right of the target and then was able to correct whereas with something with a little more oomph to it there's no chance there's no chance well and when in when you're actually showing up to matches to place at the match, one or two points can separate tenth from fifth for yeah. sure. Yeah, and I would say in general, the whole the cartridge selection thing is not gonna make or break it. Yeah, it's not gonna it's not gonna bump you up fifty places. Um, but it, yeah, it definitely Pick one and when stick it, with it yeah when it gets to the to those you know you're in the top twenty top thirty positions then then you're in the realm where a couple fine tuning things whether that's training or or equipment or whatever it it can make a little bit of a difference for you right on but yeah learning how to read wind and shoot yeah i would say if you've listened to to all this yeah uh go through your selection process and then make a selection and then shoot the snot out of it that's we've got a, a a gentleman that works in our technical services division that's getting started in it he's new to this whole thing he's asking a lot of questions he's got a lot of interest in it and he just built his first kind of, I'm going to call it precision rifle because that's what it is, uh, but it's very utilitarian. You know, it's it's probably 13 or 14 pounds. Uh, it can be configured to be less than that. It can also be configured to be certainly heavier than that. And he's got a chassis on it. Uh, it's in six millimeter arc. And this the criteria where he went through was, can I, can I shoot factory ammo? Okay, that's got to be one of my things. Is it something that has a little bit more of a ballistic efficiency than, say, a 308 Winchester. Okay, that'll help me, you know, to hit what I'm aiming at because that's fun. I want it to be fun. And then, what's the barrel life like? Okay, barrel life's great. Now, all I'm going to do is shoot the piss out of it. That uh, just pick your, make your selection, and then go shoot, go compete, cut your teeth with this stuff, and you'll learn more just from going and shooting than you will 
the you know the mental geometry of well th- th- that I better try this cartridge or this right. powder or this bullet yeah. just it's yeah it's very easy to go to a match perform poorly and then try to change start things. thinking I need to change something yeah and uh, I'll say if you're in that realm of six to six five you can probably just leave the cartridge alone and all of your components <laughs> generally that's one of those things that I've seen it time and time again you go to a match you perform poorly and then you hear that person. I'm going to try this bullet. I, I might have switched to this powder. I've got to play with my overall length. That, those ma- I'm going to change magazine. Whatever it is, just just take the same components. Nothing's broken. It's probably the nut behind the bolt. Almost I, always. I could strangle Jacob Morrow. <laughs> yeah, he was. For every time he changes something between matches. It's, it's, yeah. Every just, match, it's different, <laughs> I feel like. Yeah. There is, a key, there is something to be said about consistency. So, you know. Go through these selection criteria, your barrel life, factory availability. What's the budget? How much, you know, where, what do your brass sources look like? What powder is it taking, et cetera? Go through all of this, make your selection and run it. Now, I'd like to change gears a little bit to kind of go through the same sort of criteria, but let's talk about some other sports, maybe NRL Hunter. Let's talk about gas gun division, and let's talk about tactical division because they're, you know, those similar criteria, but you're going to come to a different answer. Um, so for NRL Hunter, there is a power factor limitation. And, uh, you know, if you're going to shoot factory ammo, they'll let you get away with a six millimeter provided there is hunting ammunition available. So, uh, that excludes the six GT, um, you know, it does include the six millimeter Creedmoor. So what, uh, what are some of your selection processes looking like for the NRL Hunter? Because that is blind stages. You've got to range your own targets, manage your data in real time. So what does that look like for you guys? There's there's uh, some cool trade-offs there because one you have to have the power factor, so that kind of forces you up in recoil. Um, and so like a 25 Creedmoor or a 65 Creedmoor is about the bottom that you can get away with and still have enough muzzle velocity and and bullet weight to to meet the minimum power factor. But the other cool thing about those matches is that they're if you hit on the first round, you're done with that target. So you if you miss, then you shoot at it again. So at maximum, those matches use up less ammo. Um, but then once you start getting in and if you if you do well, you use even less ammunition. Um, so it's a little bit less scary to use something like a PRC, like a 6.5 or even a 7 PRC. Um, and so that kind of opens up the window you, where you can, you can ballistically tilt things in your favor to get better hit probability. Yeah, first round hit, yeah. Um, y- you still have to weigh in your ability to spot your splashes, but then you can kind of bully it a little bit if you want and just say, well, I'm going to run a seven PRC and it's going to get there. And if I'm off by 20 yards on my range, who cares? It, yeah. Yeah, like, and, t- and generally in the NRL hunter stuff too, the target size is a little bit more, little, little more generous. Yeah. yeah. And There's, you're not so. going to run into, uh, you know, <laughs> multiple three quarter and one minute plates in an NRL hunter match. You're also shooting. Slightly shorter distances, right? From right. what I've and seen, I, yeah, you know, they usually would. cap it around eight or nine hundred yards. Yep. So, yeah, yeah, you could, like I said, you can you can bully it a little bit and and get away and have it be successful for you. Yep. And there's weight restrictions on the firearms, which also relates to your recoil. You know, because if you're going to run a seven PRC, but you're trying to run open light division, which has to be sub twelve pounds, it's probably going to be a problem. You're going to get pushed around a little. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, definitely that balance between rifle recoil rifle weight becomes increasingly more important yep but in what i've kind of seen like miles said you can bully it a little bit depending on what category you're in whether you're in open light open heavy or uh, factory or factory i have a couple different guns that can fit for one of, or each or one of those but not the other one and i feel like that's more the way to go pick a division shoot it all year Get comfortable, get comfortable with, it. with it. You know, don't don't try to make this gun that'll. Oh, I'll shoot light this match. I'll shoot heavy in this match. Yeah. You know, play around with that. Find something, stick to it. Yeah, especially as a and a beginner or even not beginner, but middle of the pack shooter. I think there's a lot of us middle of the pack shooters that could cross into that upper tier of the middle of the pack, if you will, just by being consistent with your gear and the divisions you're shooting in. Right. Yeah. I would say too for NRL Hunter, there's um, where we, you know traditionally we talk like PRS 22 to 65 is pretty much it. I mean, there's a couple guys running seven saws and some other stuff, 
um, few and far between, but that definitely bumps up the calibers that, that are applicable. So you're, you're looking seven millimeter, 30 caliber is again, to, to get that power factor, because not only do you have to have the minimum power factor, but the power factor is your tiebreaker for, yeah. for score. So if you shoot the same number of plates, well, if you have a 30 out six and they're squeaking by with a 25 Creedmoor, you're going to bump them in a place. Or it could be, I mean, I've seen, you know, three or four people tie and then that power factor makes, makes, you know, who, who, so you could potentially bump several places. That, that, that happened at the Nahaka match center, a hundred last one Chaz ran the Nosler team. They were, they got beat by power factor. So, but that'll happen. So yep. moving now to, I'm going to say PRS gas gun division, cause that's something that, you know, not a lot of people compete in, uh, but it's still a, a, a fun, still a very competitive division. And in my opinion, I think the answer is actually to go smaller, to go with the 22 caliber. But I'd love to hear Miles. I'd love to hear your opinion, uh, with hear what you guys think about choosing a cartridge for the gas gun division. Yeah. Well, first off, you got to pick, do you want to go large frame or small frame? And if you're going large frame, I tend to think, Six five Creedmoor, maybe six GT, um, are are probably a good way to go. Obviously, I got beat by a twenty two GT, but I'm in PRS in general. I'm afraid of going twenty two caliber for like the splash reasons. That's really it. Um, and then the thing, same thing on the small small frame ARs. You have um, six Arc is what I what I ran. A lot of guys are running that. I think three of the guys that were in the finale, three or four of us, were running six Arc. Um, it it gets you pretty close to six five Creedmoor trajectory um, with uh, way less rifle. Um, it's easier to control, less recoil. In my opinion, I think they're the small frame system is generally going to be a little bit more reliable than a large frame system. As far as like you're going to have to get into a large frame system and probably tweak more than you will. I mean, with that kind of rifle for PRS, you're going to have to tweak a lot anyway. But uh, I tend to I tend to think the small frame is more robust the way to way. go yeah okay so you're um, looking but, at but yeah. 22 arc is an interesting thing because that kind of came out while i was already invested in six arc already had the rifle built um for gas gun it it may it may win out i mean i say splash beyond 800 but the number of targets that are beyond 800 is relatively small of the total makeup of the targets that you have um so there is definitely less recoil they get there faster the bc between you know a, a heavy 22 and a heavy six millimeter they're pretty close so yeah i don't know that that comes down to try it out maybe personal preference yeah but well i'm i'm definitely if i were going to get into that that game of the the gas gun and the prs stuff i would i would lean pretty heavily towards six arc i've got you know a gas gun in it that i use as a uh, uh, uh like a night hunting rifle and things like that but yeah i mean a ammo availability as far as like being able to get stuff off the shelf it runs good i mean you can run a 24 inch barrel and get the performance that you need to to be competitive plus shooting high bc bullets but i'm as you were talking i was thinking what about our v match ammo with a in a grendel with a 100 grain vt there you go or the v match ammo in a 6 arc uh so when we were doing radar testing for the eld vt uh we basically had what was going to be the v match load and I, we shot it on radar with my gas gun. That was one of the guns that we used to get the drag profile for it. And uh, I was bullying some plates at 1,250 yards with it. And I was about that close to taking it to the finale. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I got scared. But consistency. Yeah, I got scared. Well, because I'd already done all this low development and I knew what I had was going to work. Um, and I wasn't, you know, it just, I hate to, I hate to a week before the match. That's like my least favorite thing to do is like, yeah, change something change, major. Change something yeah. major right before the match. So I didn't do it, but it, it, yeah, it would have been interesting to see how that would have played out because that ammunition I was getting very good extreme. That was factory loaded. I mean, you know, the same way, and so I was getting great extreme spreads. I was getting great ballistic performance, great accuracy, and uh, yeah. So that 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 may be a game changer. Well, and you pick up a little bit of velocity going right. that way, and right. whether that's good or bad dependent on the where, person but. where you're at with a gas gun you can you can use it right yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah i thought 22 arc specifically uh 22 gt because there are limitations with the repeatable dispersion and precision of a gas gun you've witnessed it where if i'm loaded into a bipod then it does this and if i'm on a sandbag then my you know point of aim does this or my point of impact rather does this 
you're already limited when you start stretching the legs. So let's do everything we can inside of a half a mile to put me at the biggest advantage. And I think a, a 22 cal going faster inside of that 800 yard line sets you up to score more points where the hefty majority of the targets lay, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, I could I could get by with that. And I, like I said, it, it, 22 arc kind of came along after I already had stuff rolling with 6 arc. But uh, yeah, if I was going to do gas gun again, it would definitely be something that I might might buy, put together an upper and try them both out. It'll be interesting this year to see, since we just came out with the 22 arc, if, if people will start to go that way in PRS gas gun. Mm-hmm. Or if they'll oh, yeah. stick with the big frame stuff that's traditionally kind of always been big frame. Well, now we came out with six arc and 22 arc in the small frame, and it seems like maybe people are starting to pull back a little Absolutely. bit. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think all you have to do is shoot a six arc, even if it's not a PRS built rig, shoot a six arc um, on a range where you can stretch the legs out, even in an 18 inch platform. Shoot that a little bit and then go shoot the large frame stuff on the same day. And it, it sways most people like, okay, we need, we need to be doing that. Yeah. All right. Let's transition here to our last topic which is tactical division in the prs world there is a tactical division where you have to shoot a 223 slash 556 or a 308 winchester and it has to be in a bullet weight range that the military is currently fielding so a lot of people running 308 winchester now i'm a contrarian if i was going to run tactical i'm running 223 hand loaded with our 75 grain eld match bullets again trying to stack the deck in my favor inside of 800 yards and a 75 grain ELD match doing 2950 or 3000 that's hard to beat yeah at a it, fraction of the recoil of a 308 yeah that's a tough call i think i think as many matches as we shoot out west that's the only that's my real drawback i think if we shot more matches to the east that's a no brainer 223 all day yeah um but I don't know. Those 176 A tip and the 174 yield DVT now. Yeah. Those don't suck. Those, yeah, you're right. From a drag's perspective, they do do pretty darn well. So, bullet selection, obviously, you know, one of the big criteria in the propellant selection and all that, throw in what bullets are available. And when you're rest- really restricted to what bullets you can use from a weight standpoint, you have to look at the drag. And you're right. Those do stand out. Yeah. And I think, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, the uh, AMU guys last year kind of <laughs> let us know what a 308 can do. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, with the, yeah, with the right up behind the bolt, you can oh, still yeah. do a lot with a 308. It's still very capable. And, you know, one of our sponsored shooters, uh, Charles Roberts, Charles Roberts, when he's on his A game running a 308 Winchester, same thing with Robert Brantley. Oh, yeah. Those guys will hang with the open. Le- I, I write press releases. I look at match results. There have been many times where I've seen either uh, uh, Charlie Robb or Robert Brantley up there in you know top 15 top 10 with the open guys and they're still shooting a 308 so yeah these guys and and what goes on between the ears at the match right the Hornady security fireproof keypad safe with a heavy duty 16 gauge steel body extra thick 8 gauge steel door and four 1 inch diameter locking lugs the fireproof safe achieves a fire rating of 30 minutes for up to 1400 degrees fahrenheit both the interior and adjustable shelf are covered in a protective carpet that offers flexible storage configurations while safeguarding valuables from damage the fireproof keypad safe from hornady security awesome well, guys, did you miss anything? You want to add anything to this about cartridge selection for your competitive stuff? I think I think we did a pretty good job of, of lining out some of the considerations you should have, and then really the period at the end of the sentence is make your selection and then run it and and really flush it out. Run it for a season. Run it for multiple seasons. Run it for multiple barrels. You'll do a, you'll do yourself a favor by just getting comfortable with your equipment first before you start making changes i'd like to hear a little bit from miles just on we talk a lot about six and six five it's pretty much all we've talked about today a little bit 22s where does the 25 come into play have you seen benefits to a 25 in prs versus general hunter i i I don't know well the thing is all of this uh all this lives in a circle of what's applicable and 
on you know you got recoil and uh bc and wind and whatever all on different sides of it and it's really just personal preference to where you want to live in that in that circle um yeah it, you get it, however you want to look at it it's the same thing as going six to six five you either get less bc less wind def- or more wind deflection but less recoil and then six five is the opposite and then 25 is kind of the splits it down the middle yeah I mean, it's You've seen a lot of people go to it. Yeah, it definitely, like I said, if six, five is popular and, and, and six is, is popular. Right. And you know, like you got people being very successful with both of those. Well, you're going to, you're going to see the same thing with 25. Yeah. It seems like, seems like I've seen that a little bit more this year. PRS is some people running 25, 47s, 25 creep mores, you know, yeah. going towards that it, route. It's definitely got a place. I think it's just been hindered because nobody, not, not many people made high BC yeah. long well, range bullets for it because there's no, Sammy cartridge to run in, you know, a fast seven and a half twist or whatever. But I yeah, think the, the guy... fact that R134 has the sales volume it has, proof that there are people that want to do it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely in that range of of should work without a problem. It's just a yeah a matter of whether where you want to land. And then I think, like I said, the biggest thing that's been holding it back is bullet selection for the longest time. Excellent. Anything else, guys? No. Awesome. Well, I appreciate your guys' insight. I'm looking forward to see how you guys do on the competitive circuit this year. I think, like I mentioned, I, my foot is way off the throttle as far as competing goes. Uh, I think I'll probably get in NRL Hunter match or two, uh, maybe a PRS match, maybe. But uh, uh, our summer is, man, as far as the marketeering world goes, be a lot of running around and uh, try to take as much time home as I can. But I still love to get out to do these matches. I still love being at the matches and I know you guys do as well. If you guys, as listeners, are at the, at the matches, that's one of the things that Hornady has always prided itself on before anybody else was really involved. 2013, 2014 time frame, you went to a big match. There wasn't other brands having competitors in there, but you know, Hornady had competitors there. And now it's become way more mainstream and all of the other major manufacturers will send out people to play, but we love the interaction. You know, if you're squatted up with us or, you know, if you see us at the match, we love to hear one product suggestions because that's, you know, there's been a lot of products that have been the result of coming home uh, and Hey, you know, people are asking about this. We should look into that kind of deal. So definitely love the interaction and I'm excited to see how you guys do Joe Teal and the whole rest of the, the Hornady team that competes. Um, yeah, excited to see you guys well, do this. It, yeah, it's valuable for me, honestly, because I go out, I, I design a bullet, and we test it, you know, internally, whatever, and it looks everything looks kosher, and then we go out and, and get to see it in the field, see what the actual field results are. That's that's a valuable resource for us. Absolutely. Yep. Awesome, guys. Well, thanks again, guys. Hopefully, you enjoyed this podcast about your competitive cartridge selection. We hope some of this criteria helps you chop through it and pick out the right cartridge for you. We hope you enjoyed it. And we'll catch you on the next one.